part peaceful compliance. But racial progress does not come without pressure. And come the first of the year, our executive board and all of you will plan our agenda for the year, which will include jobs, which will include appointments on boards, better improvement in our city and appointments on boards and so forth. It will include everything that we are involved in in this city, wherever our money is involved as taxpayers. This is what our agenda will consist of. And we will work that agenda diligently to try to reason together with those who are in power to come to some sensible agreement that will be satisfactory for the betterment and improvement of all the people in this our community. People say that Brunswick is divided between the come here's and the been here's, and being here takes a long time. Mrs. Georgia Gibbs has been here for 76 years. Her father was a stevedore, and she knew these docks when Brunswick was a thriving seaport. As a young college graduate, she helped to found the Brunswick NAACP, and she is still its treasurer. She talks with Lois Shaw. Mrs. Gibbs, what was the feeling of white people toward Negroes when you were a girl? When I was a girl, I considered the feeling a very good one. With, uh, if Negroes had nothing to do but work, domestic work, I mean women. And if you were employed in a white family and you had illness in your home or any trouble, they would come to your rescue, see if you had medicine, food, and a doctor. But in recent years, things grew different. How different? Well, it seems if uh, strangers came into the community after our shipyard and... Um, when was that? Oh, uh, you mean the year it mm -hmm. was in? Well, around what time was that? About 20 or uh, 25 years ago. And uh, of course it made a little difference. They didn't seem to care as much about each other and their welfare. I see. Have there been any other changes in the attitude as the years have gone by? Oh, yes. The changes has come. Uh, of course, Negro had more money and they could build better homes and they got cars and uh, they had better schools and so everything grew better. And do you think this has changed the attitude and created more respect for the Negro? Has or created more, more respect for the Negroes and a better attitude and they are thought of in a better light. How do you see that in your daily life? Well, I see in daily life because of the way the people are treated. Years ago, anybody would have thought it was a terrible thing to call a Negro Mr. or Mrs. Now you get your bills from the stores and the city as Mr. or Mrs. Has that been a recent development? Yeah, or? that has been a recent development. I see. Now, in the very early days of the NAACP here in Brunswick, uh, what was your part in that? I was a treasurer, I was elected treasurer when the, uh, when the organization was really founded. And could you tell us about that time? But the uh, finding, well, uh, just like most places, people have heard of people in, in the cities that were a little prosperous. And so when the NAACP, I met, opened that first office in Atlanta, they came to, um, to Brunswick as to see if we could build an organization here. And uh, one night we had a meeting at the St. Paul Methodist Church, which now still exists, but remodeled. And that night we had around about 300 people coming to know, coming to see what could be done for the Negroes. And was there a speaker there, you mean There that? was a speaker there. I don't remember just who it was, but it was a speaker there from, out of, from Atlanta. Now, was that the very beginning? Was That's the NAACP the first organized? First time we've ever had a meeting in the, in the beginning of it. it was in October. I don't remember the date, but it was in October, now, 1929. What happened in the ensuing years? Everybody's going to get disinterested. But six or seven of us kept it on. And we knew what I mean, kept attending the meetings and things. And uh, we knew if we didn't get somebody who could interest the people, that it would probably go down. And we asked Reverend Hope to come to our meeting. And when he came, because our president was a minister, and he had been um, called to another church in another city. And after a good bit of persuasion, he said he would um, 
be the president if a native, now I was, uh, was we call ourselves native, and he said, I lived here, and if I would go with him, he would go. With the influence of Mrs. Gibbs, the Reverend Julius Caesar Hope became the leader of the NAACP in 1960. Having been active with Martin Luther King in the Montgomery bus boycott, he was well versed in the then new techniques of nonviolence. Although things had been quiet in Brunswick, much needed doing. At his campaign headquarters near the center of town, the Reverend Hope talks with Andrew Stern. Reverend Hope, what were things like when you first came to this community more than five years ago? Well, I can say I believe that uh, the whites took silence for satisfaction. And that's about the way it was, and nobody actually had moved out to try to ask for those things that actually they deserved because of the taxes that they are involved with in this town. I believe that we should have representation along with taxation. Yes. What was the Negro community like at that time? Uh, somewhat complacent. Uh, satisfied to a great extent. Uh, that's about where it was at that time. So what did you do? Actually, in becoming the head of the NAACP, we tried to look around to see actually what the town needed. Not the Negroes, what the town needed. And uh, one day, uh, so happened, the dentist had a convention on Jacob. And in going to Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island, right. And we decided we'd go play a little golf. Reverend Mr. Holmes, Dr. Wilkes, and a couple others from Savannah, and some other parts. So we went over to the golf course at, at high noon, and as soon as we got in there, they closed it down and said that they were watering it. And at that point, we began running through my mind that we needed some type of organization, some organization that would move forth that when they said it was closed, we could remain there until it opened, until they tell us either we could use it or we couldn't use it. Now, if they told us we couldn't use it, then we had a court case. But if they, if they didn't tell us anything, we just had to work with it until actually, you know, we could get some breakthrough. What happened after that? After that, we started having mass meetings every Thursday night, and we've been having mass meetings ever since. Uh, <clears throat> we went into action, and uh, actually, I began checking statistics from other areas that were involved in these demonstrations and the movement and what have you. And at that point, I tried to pick out the, the good and leave the bad. So we decided we'd use the procedure of writing letters to all areas of our government, whereas we thought we should have some advantage, some progress. I wrote to the city commission, county commissioners, Merchants Association, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the chain stores, wrote to everybody that actually, uh, where we thought we should get some consideration. And believe it or not, we, we received good response from city, county, merchants. A few was kind of slow in answering, but uh, it, in a few days, we were having conferences with city commission and county commission, budget association, chamber of commerce, and so forth. And this is the way we actually moved. What uh, did you do with the people who were a little bit slow in responding? Uh, they finally came in, so we didn't have to do anything, actually. Well, were there any pickets or demonstrations or, or any violence at all in this town? How, how do you account for the fact that uh, in Jacksonville and in Savannah there was a lot of uh, action last summer and there was practically nothing at all here? Well, I believe uh, the whole situation depends on how you go about it, you see. Uh, actually, in our letters, we did not demand anything uh, at that time. We were asking for a conference that we might come together and reason together to try to work out these problems. And I believe in order to keep down friction or violence or what have you is that you must have a meeting of mind uh, maybe you do not go along with something all the way but it's going to have to be some give and some take in order for us to move on uh, as peaceful as possible uh, i believe other towns had a whole lot of problems because they did not go through any challenge they didn't have no means of communication maybe they didn't even try to find any means of communication maybe they just decided one night that they would go out the next day and sit in. 
But this is not the way to do it as far as I'm concerned. I believe that uh, wherever you think that you should have some advantage, I think you should go to that person and try to have a conference, try to talk with the people involved, and try to work out something. Now, when you can't work it out after a period of time, make sure you do all you can to work it out. But after you, uh, if you find out you just can't work it out, then you have to use the next best thing. And it so happened that we didn't have to come to that point until uh, uh, maybe about six months ago, eight months ago, something like this. We had, we had been involved with some stores, predominantly in Negro areas, living off of Negroes, had about 85% Negro patronage. We had talked to them about maybe two years. They wouldn't do anything, wouldn't hire anybody. So one Friday, we decided we'd have to use some picket signs. And we used it for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And on the next Thursday, we got some action. So that was the first time we actually had to use it, a picket sign. It was peaceful picketing, no trouble, no problems. And you haven't picketed that store again? No, we haven't had. We, we've had good cooperation. Well, now, in the November election, this town went for Senator Goldwater. And in the recent election, uh, in which you ran for the uh, town council, you were defeated by a very narrow margin. Uh, with all of this racial peace, how do you account for these votes? Is, is there an active element of, of the White Citizens Council? Is, is there really a backlash against what you've been doing? No, I, 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 don't think it's a, I don't think it's a backlash. I think it's been here all the time, actually. And we must understand that the only things that we have gotten, they have not come easy. We had to uh, push for them. Uh, they didn't just give them to us. Uh, and if, uh, about this Goldwater situation here in this town, th those people are here. Uh, I, I think that we have people here just like they are in Mississippi and everywhere else, actually. But the, the, the better thinking people want the town to continue to move in the right direction. So uh, at crucial times, they usually come through with something substantial in order that we might keep the peace and harmony in the community. After generations of paternalism, most white Southerners still must learn to deal with the Negro as an equal. So too, the Southern Negro must learn his rights and the uses of power. Every Thursday night, the Reverend Hope conducts a mass meeting in his church. After the election, we saw men crying, ladies, boys and girls crying, our hearts were broken, very sad. You had a right to be sad, for you fought a good fight. You know, it is always hard to lose something which you want so badly. And when you lose it, it just, you know, I don't have no been a smiling when I lose. It's like the next day, I was downtown and one of the white gentlemen asked, said to me, Sir Reverend says, uh, if I was you last night, says I would have told the, the newsman, or the, the radio man, the announcer, to wait until tomorrow morning before I would make a statement because I could tell myself that you was a little upset. And I turned to him and says, you right, I was upset. <laughs> These same people actually, which we as Negroes spend our money and cause them to ride in Cadillac cars and fly in airplanes and have wall to wall carpets and televisions in every room. These same people whom we are keeping alive and have been keeping alive for all these years, spending our monies with them, these same people could not find the time to show good faith by voting for a Negro, not a Negro, but a qualified Negro who was trying to represent all the people. So actually, that's the reason I was a little upset, to tell you the truth. Just because of that, I was a little upset. But this showed us one thing, this showed us one thing. You know, uh, the gentleman told a story the other night, says there was a, a frozen snake on the ground. A frozen snake on the ground, who had frozen almost to death. And this man walked by and he picked him up and he had compassion on him and he put him in his bosom. And the snake began to warm up. And after a while, after he had warmed and thawed up and got, it, got himself together and moved around within the bosom of the man, 
we found that the snake bit the man. Then he st stuck his head out of the man's shirt and his coat and looked up at him and licked his tongue out at him. And the man says, oh, snake says, you know, I was very kind to you. You was freezing to death and I saved your life. Why did you treat me so mean? And the snake replied in so many words, using your imagination now. He says that, uh, amen. <laughs> The snake replied to him, says, now you knew I was a snake all the time. <laughs> you still talking about. Amen. Now, we have some good whites in this community, but you see, the majority of them here and everywhere else, we know what they've been doing all these years. So why fool ourselves? The only thing that we are gonna have to do and the only thing that we can do to win an election here in this day, is that we must put more Negroes on the books than white folks. <laughs> but we're not, we're not trying to scare anyone. But from now on, what we are going to do, while we are building up this voter's registration, what we are going to do, we are going to determine who go in City Hall and who come out of City Hall. I want you all to know, just because we lost the election, my heart wasn't broken. I've been losing and winning all my life. Yeah. You see, I've been up and I've been down all of my life. You see, so it's no big thing for, for me to have dark days. For See, my history and the history of my foreparents and your foreparents are days of darkness, yeah. of days when we work for the white man all day yeah. for just a little pot liquor. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And we work for a whole lot of others, nothing living in shacks where it rained in the house and all this kind of thing, and we've been doing this all of our days. And tell you the truth, to a large extent, we're still in slavery. Because in a whole lot of places, even around here, we have some Negroes making 75 cents an hour. You see, that's just like pot liquor. Just like pot liquor. So we, we don't need to feel bad and sad. See, we, we used to this kind of thing. We used to being mistreated. But this is what we must understand. Just because we are mistreated and misused, and just because we are buked and scorned, we ourselves cannot move in that same category. See, once, uh, just because a man hate you and you begin hating that man, then if you begin hating the man, you become just like the man. Like the man. So what I'm trying to say, evil, evil against evil cannot correct evil. But you must have evil over against love. And once you have evil over against love, love will always win out. You heard the old saying, somebody says that truth crashed to the ground will rise again. You can't keep that which is good down. You can't keep love down to save your life. You can't keep right down to save your life. And I want to tell you this one thing. One day, and it won't be long, we will have a city commissioner on the city commission here in Brunswick, Georgia. Yeah. 